Today's lecture focuses on um, charged particles and magnetic fields. So we've already discussed in previous lectures how electric fields exert forces on charged particles. If you have an established electric field shown here by the vector E for the electric field, on a charge Q shown by uh, Q here in this variable, then there's a force on it according to F is equal to QE. So the particles are going to feel that force whether they're moving or not, right, or stationary. If you have a positively charged particle, then the charge will want to move in the direction that the electric field points or downstream. But if it's a negatively charged particle, it will be forced to move upstream on that electric field. It'll feel a force upstream. Now, magnetic fields don't behave the same way. Magnetic fields don't exert forces on stationary charged particles. They only exert forces on moving charged particles. So the equation that governs the force that a moving charged particle feels in a magnetic field is F is equal to QV cross B. Here, yet again, Q is the charge, the magnitude of the charge. V is the velocity vector describing um, the motion of the charge. B is the magnetic field vector, and F is the force that's felt. This is a vector cross product, okay? Now, if you have both electric fields and magnetic fields, then the total force will be this, the vector sum of the charge felt from the electric field plus the magnetic field. This is known as the Lorentz force law. Here, F is equal to QE plus QV cross B. But since we've already spent some time focusing on F is equal to QE in previous chapters, right now I'd like to discuss just the motion um, that results from a charged particle, a moving charged particle in a magnetic field. To find the magnitude of that force, remember this is a vector cross product, and when you multiply two vectors in a vector cross product, the magnitude is proportional to the sine of the angle in between those vectors. So the magnitude of the force, F, is equal to QVB sine of theta, where theta is the angle in between QV and B. Now, when a charged particle moves parallel to the magnetic field vector, then theta is zero, or 180 degrees and the sine of zero or 180 degrees is zero. And so that means that there is no force um, from the magnetic field on that moving charged particle if that's the case. But if the particle's velocity vector makes any angle that's not equal to zero or 180 degrees with the field, then the force acts in a direction perpendicular to both the velocity and the field, according to the vector cross product, okay? To remind you of a vector cross product, to find the direction, you use the right-hand rule. So remember that when you're multiplying QV cross B, QV is your first vector. You take your right hand, QV is your index finger, right? B would be your middle finger, and the resultant force would be your thumb. So for example, if QV points this way, this is my magnetic field, then my force would be up, okay? So if I rotate my hand, and now you stare at the screen, you can see that QV here is the red vector in that um, image A on the left, and then B would be the green, and then that means that resultant force would be up, okay? So that's the vector right-hand rule. Another way to do it is to take your palm, this one's stop in the name of love, right? <laughs> this is the gun, and this is stop in the name of love. So in stop in the name of love, you take your hand, you point your fingers first in the direction of QV, and then you swing your palm towards B, and you end at B, and then your thumb is yet again the direction of the resultant force. So that's two ways to do the vector cross product. Remember that if you have a positive charge Q, right, then QV points in the direction of, of the velocity. But if you have a negative, negative charge Q, then that flips the direction of your velocity vector 180 degrees, okay? And so what that means is that your resultant force for a negative charge particle moving in a magnetic field will be in the opposite direction to a positive charge moving through that same magnetic field, okay? So for example, that's shown in image B here on the slide. Here, both um, particles have a velocity that's up, and both particles have a magnetic field that's pointing to the right. But one of the particles is negatively charged and one is positively charged, and that means that the um, direction of the force on those two particles is in the opposite direction, okay? 
this motion of charged particles in magnetic fields um, has a lot of applications. For example, um, charged particles moving in magnetic fields will make circles or helixes, and you can use the radius of that circle in a magnetic field to find the charge to mass ratio of the particle, and this is the foundation of some mass spectrometers out there. You can take um, some unknown samples and measure their charge to mass ratio if you force them through a magnetic field and you know their velocity. Okay. Um, shown here in the picture is an image, a top-down image of an experiment very similar to one that we do here for some of um, our modern physics or advanced lab students where they measure directly the charge to mass ratio of the electron by forcing it to move at a known velocity through a magnetic field. All right. So there's a few more differences between electric and magnetic fields um, when you have charged particles moving through them. And one of those really important differences is the idea of work. So remember from our introductory physics class, we define the work as the dot product of the force and the displacement. Okay? So since it's a dot product, then that means that work is done if the force and the displacement have components that are parallel to one another. That means that the electric force, F is equal to QE, does work in displacing a charged particle because its force is exerted in the direction that it's going to push it, right? However, the magnetic force associated with a steady magnetic field does no work when the particle is displaced. And that's because the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to its displacement, okay? So magnetic fields, steady magnetic fields, do no work on charged particles. Now as a consequence of that, the work kinetic energy theorem states that the sum of the works is equal to a change in kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of a charged particle moving through a steady or constant magnetic field cannot be altered by the magnetic field alone, and that's because no work is done. So if no work is done by the magnetic field, then it doesn't change its kinetic energy, right? What it can do is change the direction of the velocity, but it doesn't change its speed. Here's a top-down view of a particle moving in an external magnetic field that has a velocity perpendicular to the field. In this image shown here, the magnetic field is represented as going into your screen. And it's represented that way because of the axis. That's supposed to look like the back side of an arrow, the, the feathers of an arrow going into the screen, okay? So the X's represent a magnetic field that's into your screen. You can see here that you have a positively charged particle Q here in orange, and it's got a velocity vector that's perpendicular to the field. And that's because, of course, the velocity vector is in the plane of your screen, and the magnetic field is into the screen, so they'll always be perpendicular to one another. Now you can see that at every point along the curve, the force on that moving charged particle is indicated by the blue arrow. So you can see that the force is always pointing perpendicular to both velocity and the magnetic field. Well, since your force is perpendicular to your velocity at all times, that causes it to make a circle in the magnetic field. So it changes the direction of the velocity vector constantly as it goes around the circle, right? But it won't change the magnitude of velocity, only the direction. This circling of charged particles in the magnetic field can be quantified in the following way. The magnetic force causes a centripetal force on the particle, so we can equate those two things. If it's truly, um, if the velocity is always, velocity vector is always perpendicular to the magnetic field, then the sine of 90 degrees is 1, and so that sine term goes away. So when we write the force in the magnetic field, magnitude, we can just write QVB. Then we can set that equal to the magnitude of our centripetal force. You might remember that the equation for centripetal force is mv squared over r. Here, of course, m is the mass of the particle, v is its speed, v is the magnetic field, q is the charge, and r would be the radius of the circle that results. Now, you can rearrange this equation and solve for r just with some simple algebra. And then you see that the radius would be equal to mv over qb. So this is what I was talking about in some mass spectrometers. If you know the velocity of your particle going into a known magnetic field, then you can measure the radius of that circle, and so you can find Q over M, which is the charge to mass ratio. Okay?
Now we can also measure other things. So for example, if the charged particle is moving along and it's not losing energy due to any other things, okay, so over a short period of time at least, maybe it's making no inelastic collisions so its velocity is pretty constant, right? Then in that case, um, you can say that it's making a uniform circular motion and the velocity is not changing. Then you can estimate what the period of the motion would be, okay, assuming those things. From um, that, you can see, first we could find our angular speed of the particle, and that's how many radians per second it makes when it's in its circular motion, and that would be equal to V over R. Using our equation R is equal to MV over QB, we can rearrange that to find omega, or V over R, and that would give us QB over M. And of course, our angular speed, omega, is related to the period of the motion. So the period of the motion t is equal to 2 pi over omega. When we plug that into the equation, we can see that the period of the motion is 2 pi m over qb. So the period, to remind you, is how long it takes to go around the circle one time, okay? Now we were talking about circular motion of charged particles in magnetic fields. When the velocity vector is perpendicular, to the magnetic field and has no parallel components. But that, of course, doesn't always have to happen. The velocity vector can have uh, a random direction, and so it could have both perpendicular and parallel components relative to the magnetic field. If it's got both perpendicular and parallel components, then it doesn't make perfect circles all the time. What it does instead is make a helix, okay? So then, the same equations that we've covered above will still apply, except the velocity components that are parallel to the magnetic field cause it to keep moving forward, whereas the perpendicular components are what causes it to circle, okay? So in those equations that we just discussed, finding the radius, finding the period, the velocity in those equations would have to be the velocity perpendicular to that magnetic field, the perpendicular component only, and then the parallel component to the magnetic field will cause it to keep moving forward, as you can see here in the orange helical path for this charged particle, okay? I'd like to do an example problem of this, because an example is worth a million words, so here we go. A uniform magnetic field of magnitude 0.15 tesla is directed along the positive x-axis. We have a positron moving at 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second that enters the field along a direction that makes an angle of 85 degrees with the x-axis, which is of course our magnetic field direction. The motion of the particle is then a helix, so calculate the pitch and the radius of the helix. Now if you're not familiar with this jargon, of course the pitch of the helix is the distance that it's traveled in one complete turn, and it's indicated here on the drawing at right by this P, okay? All right, let's do this. First, what we'll have to do is calculate the perpendicular and parallel components of our velocity to our magnetic field. Now, since our magnetic field points along the x-axis here, then we can solve for the perpendicular or parallel components using the magnitude of the velocity, which is 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, and then the trigonometric functions. You can see here that the velocity vector makes an angle of 85 degrees with the x-axis. So our perpendicular components of the velocity would be the sine of that angle. So here we have 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second times the sine of 85 degrees, and that gives us our perpendicular velocity component of 4.98 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Now our parallel component, we would use the cosine of 85 degrees. So that would be V parallel is 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second times the cosine of 85 degrees, which is 4.36 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. Okay, now that we've solved for the parallel and the perpendicular components, we can go ahead and solve for the radius and the pitch of our helix. We can use our equation R is equal to MV over QB, except now we're not going to plug in the total speed of the particle. We're only going to plug in for our velocity the perpendicular component, because that's the component that's perpendicular to the magnetic field that causes the circle. So here, our new slightly modified formula is R is equal to MV perp over QB. Plugging in for that, the mass of a positron, remember, to remind you, 
antiparticles have the same mass but opposite charge to the corresponding particle, and the positron is the antiparticle to the electron. So it has the same mass of the electron, but it's positively charged instead of negatively charged. The mass of an electron or a positron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. We then multiply that times V perp, which I just showed you above, is 4.98 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. And then we divide that by QB. Q is the charge, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and B is 0.15 tesla. Plugging all that into our calculator, we end up with 0.19 millimeters for the radius of our helix. All right, moving on, now we have to find the pitch of the helix. So the pitch is how far it moves in X during that time. It's moving forward still along the magnetic field line there, okay, in addition to making the circles. So in order to find out how far it moves, we'd have to multiply the parallel velocity component times the time it takes to make one circle, and then that'll give us the pitch. So the time that it takes us to make one circle is the period. The equation for the period is 2 pi m over qb. Plugging in for those things, we have 2 pi times 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms divided by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times 1.15 tesla. When we multiply all that out, plug it into our calculator, we end up with 0.24 nanoseconds for the time it takes the um, positron to go around the circle once. Now we multiply that times the parallel component of the velocity and that will give us our pitch. That's 0.24 nanoseconds times 4.36 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And then that gives us our pitch, that gives us our pitch of 0.104 millimeters. Okay? Alright, now you might be wondering about some of the applications for this. Well, mass spectrometers is one, but maybe a more fun one might be the auroras. So these are called by the Van Allen radiation belts, and the Van Allen radiation belts consist of charged particles that surround the Earth in these donut-shaped regions. The donut shape comes from the Earth's magnetic field. So the particles are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. They originally come from the sun or other um, so sources outside of our solar system these charged particles coming at our planet. And then they're guided by the Earth's magnetic field lines. Remember that the parallel components to the Earth's magnetic field cause it to move along the magnetic field line, whereas the perpendicular components cause it to circle. And that traps the particles, and they move along the magnetic field lines, kind of bouncing from pole to pole, all right? So here they are, moving along from pole to pole, and then they spiral in, okay? What happens is as they spiral in towards the Earth, moving in towards the Earth along the magnetic field lines, it excites the air molecules. They collide with the molecules in our air and excite the electrons in those air molecules into higher energy levels. When they're excited into a higher energy level, eventually they want to decay back down into their ground state. And when they do that, they emit photons of light, right? So when the light is emitted, it makes these beautiful colors. So the electronic structure of the atoms or molecules in the air that it collides with um, is, d is determined by uh, the, I'm sorry, the color is dictated by what kind of molecules you have. You could have atomic oxygen, that creates the red colors, molecular nitrogen, the blue, and the molecular oxygen, the green colors. And then of course, which atoms or molecules get pinged, that one's dictated by al altitude, okay? Now, if the particles go too low in altitude, then the energetic particles might have been slowed by too many collisions and you might not see it. So, that's a more fun application. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, as always, let me know in class. And I'll see you later. Bye.